Today on CityCast DC, could Virginia politics actually kill the plan to move the Wizards and the Capitals? For once, DC types are rooting for the NIMBYs. Plus, there's a safety push in Chinatown and a debate over what makes a dive bar good. I'm here with Virginia Public Radio's Michael Pope and CityCast's Kayla Cote Stemmerman. Today is Friday, February 16th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Michael. Hey there. How are you? Good morning, Kayla. Good morning. All right. So, Kayla, you write a lot about nightlife and things to do in DC, and uh, you didn't think until recently that your professional requirements uh, involved following the Virginia State Senate. (laughs) But here we are. Here we are. Uh, Michael, you actually cover the Virginia State Senate. What has happened this week? Well, the first thing to remember is this is a brand new Senate. You know, in the old days, um, and by old days, I mean like last year, the Senate was kind of sleepy, elderly group. The current version of the Senate is the median age has gone down by like 20 years. So this is um, not your grandfather's Senate that we're talking about, but the brand new Senate finance chair, L. Louise Lucas from the Hampton Roads area. She is basically stopping the deal dead in its tracks in terms of the money part of it. So the Senate version of the bill, which was introduced by the uh, Senate Majority Leader Scott Suravel, did not make it out of Luis Lucas's finance committee. So uh, there is still a House version of the bill that is still alive. It did pass the House and the Senate will be considering that. So it's um, really kind of in trouble right now, but not quite dead yet. Wait, so the bill is the enabling legislation to move the team and it involves some public money. What is her problem with it? I thought this thing was a great deal for Virginia. So the legislation actually creates an authority. The state run authority would use public bonding. It would borrow money using the triple A credit rating that taxpayers have in Virginia. And so that's really kind of where things get bogged down is Okay, so you create this authority. The authority actually owns the facility, rents it to Monumental. How do you do the financing for the authority and all that goes into that? That's the sort of legislative thing that, I mean, this is a Northern Virginia project, but members of the General Assembly all over Virginia have a vote because this authority would be a statewide authority. So is her problem something about the actual bill or is... I understand that the governor, Republican Glenn Youngkin, gave some super partisan speech and this really pissed everyone off. And this could be the cause of the bill's troubles. Over the weekend, the governor spoke at Washington and Lee University, gave kind of a hyper partisan speech, blasting the Democrats who did not like the tone of that. And uh, El Luis Lucas is very active on social media Saturday night. She basically said that she was done with the whole conversation and that wouldn't be on the docket for the Senate Finance Committee. So she also has some red lines. You know, I've spoken to the chairwoman about this issue and she wants toll relief in her region uh, for tunnels and road tolls. There's also some specific projects in her region and her area that she wants financing for. And then there's something that's totally unrelated to the arena, which is licenses to sell retail marijuana, retail licenses to sell marijuana. Luis Lucas tells me that's a red line for her. She will not support the arena without the governor putting his signature on a bill to allow retail sales from marijuana. That seems unlikely. I mean, our governor has said over and over again, he's not interested in retail sales for marijuana. So it's, you know, striking to me that the Alexandria Arena deal could actually fall through for reasons that have nothing to do with the Alexandria Arena. How much of this do you think is like a real threat and how much of this is just sort of like posturing to get like a better deal or like a better situation for Virginia? That's a really good point. I mean, Eloise Lucas could have a strategy of talking about the retail sales for marijuana, but it's just a negotiating position. We don't know because the negotiations are still ongoing. All right. So in the meantime, insofar as there are serious uh, qualms on the other side of the river about the deal, the D.C. authorities who, who lost the stadium are kind of trying a little bit in their own way to stir the embers there. That you know, The mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, did an op-ed in the Post 
explaining that she still wants to have the arena and is willing to do various uh, financial things to help Ted Leonsis, the owner, stay in D.C. They've also issued a report analyzing the finances of the Virginia deal and saying Virginians may be on the hook for a lot more money than uh, has been promised. Is that the kind of thing that could actually, I I realize there's a lot of gamesmanship going on here, but is that the kind of thing that could actually change the minds either of people in the state legislature or closer to the ground in Alexandria? Yeah, well, facts matter. And we've got a lack of facts. I mean, if you look at the 30,000 jobs everyone's always talking about, so the governor talks about this deal, he always references 30,000 jobs, which is a number that was come up by a consultant came up with that number. And we don't have a lot of detail about those 30,000 jobs. How many of them are service sector employees? How many of them are marketing professionals? How many of those 30,000 jobs are existing jobs pirated from D.C. to Alexandria? These are questions we do not have the answer for. And lawmakers are being asked to vote in a scenario where there's not a lot of detail that's available to the public. I think members of the General Assembly might have access to data that you and I don't have access to. But for right now, in terms of what the public knows about those 30,000 jobs, it's pretty light. So that report that you're talking about might raise additional questions about the murky finances that we really don't know a lot about at this point. Well, and also with any stadium, you know, whether it's in Virginia or D.C. or wherever, there's just a lot of BS, too. Economic development numbers can be kind of fishy sometimes. Yeah. And a lot of these jobs would happen with or without an arena. I mean, we've had neighborhoods turn around in D.C. that have stadiums. We've had neighborhoods turn around in D.C. that don't. What has been the mayor's response? Like, What has been D.C.'s response to this? Like, what is she offering? I mean, look, they've offered a very large subsidy for improving the existing arena. And I mean, we'll talk about it in a second, but they've also sort of made some statements about taking seriously the complaints about chaos and so on in Chinatown around the arena. Although Ted Leonsis, the owner of the team, says that's really not his motivation, whether that's right or not, I don't I don't know. I mean, he has said, you know, the die is cast and this is done and so on. The folks in Virginia may have something to do with it. I know that the legislative session ends on March 9th. So what's the timetable now? I mean, what's going to happen with these bills? Does something have to pass by then? What happens if it doesn't? Every time you think there's a deadline, there's another special session. So, I mean, it's, you know, while March is kind of ostensibly a deadline, they could always have a special session. So I would imagine this conversation uh, would definitely be going on through the remainder of the General Assembly session. You know, is it possible for the governor and the finance chairwoman to cut a deal between now and the beginning of March? I don't know. It kind of seems doubtful to me. But then you could always have a special session afterwards. Wait, and then. On the lower level, in Alexandria, we see neighbors protesting. They don't like the arena for various reasons. That, I assume, is operating kind of on a separate timetable. But what are the prospects of that? And and you know, what power did, would they have to stop it? And how likely is it to happen? Well, you would need to have the authority first because the authority would own the facility. And so then the Alexandria City Council would theoretically make zoning changes, but that would really be after the authority is created. So the chain of events here is that the first thing that needs to happen is the General Assembly create this state authority to use public bonding authority, the triple A credit of the people of Virginia. And the state run authority would actually own this land and rent it to Monumental. So the Alexandria City Council really would come in on the back end of the General Assembly creating the authority. There's a new play at Gala Theater in Columbia Heights, and this one sounds really interesting. Christina Garcia's gripping play, The Palacio Sisters, is a Latinx adaptation of Chekhov's Three Sisters, and it captures the vibrant chaos of 1985 Miami. Three sisters and their brother, who recently arrived from Havana, navigate Miami's treacherous landscape filled with drug wars and rampant violence. It's a story of challenged family bonds, resilience, and longing. Check out the world premiere in Spanish with English surtitles also known as super titles, at Gala Theater this month. The show is running through February 25th. For more information and tickets, visit galatheater.org. Once again, that's galatheater.org. Let's be real. Lawsuits are not fun. But with Paulson & Nace, at least they're a little easier. Paulson & Nace is a DC law firm in every sense of the word. It was founded here in 1979. The two partners, Chris and Matt Nace, were both born here and are local leaders who care deeply about the DC community. 
Paulson and Nace handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases when someone has been hurt by the negligence of others. And they don't just settle every case. They'll go to court. They'll fight for you. Paulson and Nace has even been recognized as one of U.S. News' best law firms. So, if you have been hurt or have lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson and Nace for a no-obligation consultation. Visit www.paulsonandnace.com or call 202-463-1999. So this is sort of related, but this week, kind of shutting the barn doors after the Wizards and the Capitals have left, the mayor of D.C., the D.C. government police department, announced uh, a plan for what they call uh, safe commercial corridor hubs, which uh, the first of which will be in Chinatown. These are these sort of police substations with the drop-in facility. The cops can do paperwork there instead of having to go all the way back to the precinct. The idea is to show more police presence and... Brooke Pinto, who's a member of the DC Council, literally said, "This is to show we get it." And you know, I think that's the, I think the big criticism from a lot of locals in general in the face of this crime moment we're having, but particularly after the announcement that the teams wanted to leave, which is that the government has not displayed a kind of empathy and a sense that they understand that a lot of their constituents are really alarmed about the reports of crime and carjacking and so on. So. They're opening this facility in Chinatown. There'll be another one in Anacostia a little later in the year and one along U Street. So again, another place that a lot of visitors come to and where they want to sort of create more of a sense of safety. So will this actually like increase the police presence in those areas? Like, will we see more police officers, you know, walking around or is it just that they have a space to go to that's just close by? I mean, that's the theory. You know, look, at for cops, you know, it's a sort of a multifaceted job. They're supposed to patrol, which, you know, in dense neighborhoods ought to mean being on foot. But then when there's an arrest, when there's an incident, there is a bunch of the paperwork. There's stuff that has to be done. They go back and forth to the precinct, which is often, there is one right along U Street at like 17th, but there's not one in the middle of Chinatown. And police have to go to court to testify. There's a lot of back and forth. And a lot of people, particularly people who come to sort of tourist and nightlife areas, like the sense of safety, the feeling that this neighborhood is important enough to be policed. I'm kind of struck by the fact that the first one is Chinatown. I mean, is this just a naked political reaction to the discussion we were just having about the arena moving out of an area that has a problem with crime? I mean, I think it's about the problem with crime, right? I mean, there's sort of a crazy story at that Walgreens in Chinatown where there was a shooting of a serial thief. And then now there's been sort of more developments around that, turning it into sort of a crazy inside job crime caper story. But the point is, I don't think anyone really, really, really knows why crime goes up or goes down. There's still a lot of like, why did it fall so much in the 90s? You know, there's some crediting to changed police strategy, but there's a lot of there's demographic and economic explanations. So I think what they're scrambling to do now, which I have been baffled that they didn't do earlier, is just sort of show the citizens that, hey, like, we actually think this thing is really important and we want to just fly the flag. Um, I don't know uh, any better than anyone else whether that will literally mean there is less crime uh, in Chinatown, but it seems like a kind of useful a symbolic thing to do for your citizens at a time when they've been, I mean, the city government, a lot of people in politics have been incredibly defensive and kind of dumb about this and quibbling statistically, like, well, is it a crime wave or is it a crime surge? And it's like, give me a break. Just, you know, people just want to know like, hey, we're worried and the people we vote for have our back. Well, it sounds good that it, they're not just focusing on Chinatown. You mentioned they also have these substations opening up in Anacostia and U Street. That's right. I mean, Kayla, you have more of a life than me, and I'm going to go on a limb and suggest you have maybe more of a life than Michael. Um, I wouldn't say would, that. <laughs> would so would like being out, like knowing that there's like more police presence, a police substation where you, the citizen, can drop in if you have some need or complaint to make. Would that make you feel safer? I suppose it could in certain situations. You know, I'm curious. Like, is there anybody that? is against this? Like, has there been any talk of like, you know, what the possible downsides of this could be? You know, I'm one of those people who's like kind of terrified of authority figures, you know, and like police in general, like I, my worst nightmare is getting pulled over. So, you know, I don't love the idea of like police walking around while I'm trying to go out and having a good time, but it is important, mm. right? Like, obviously this is a huge issue and 
it's important to feel safe in your town and your city, but your home. But you don't want to be over policed either. But yeah, but I also don't want I also don't want to be, you know, um over policed, I guess. So is there like a downside to this? I have not heard anybody saying like, oh, this is outrageous, this is an army of occupation, the kind of things that people say about over policing. And I mean, I don't know, in my experience, like covering city neighborhoods back in the day. You know, one of my friends used to say, like, I had been to a lot of community meetings. He never heard anyone say they want less police. There's too much police. They've heard plenty of people say they want better police. They want more decent, you know, humane police, et cetera. But the way I see it, like important and valuable places, like the National Gallery is like very well policed. And treating people's own neighborhoods, neighborhoods where people go out as also important places that are worth protecting is probably a good political move. That obviously is a move that can be completely undone if there are incidents of bad police behavior, which are, you know, have been too frequent. But I think it's sort of a belated kind of we get this thing. And as much as I'm like sort of chagrined that it, it took a while, it seems like it's probably a no brainer. I don't know if policing will help people's decisions to go to dive bars. But there's actually been a a big debate in D.C. Uh, Eater put out a list of what they view as best dive bars. Lists like this are meant to generate debate with people saying, how could you leave this place on? Or why'd you put that place on the list? It sucks. Kayla, tell us what's in the list. What did you like? What did you not like? Yeah. So, you know, Eater came out with this list of D.C.'s most lovable dive bars. And I mean, it's a good list. It's a good list. There's a lot of winners on here. Most of my favorites are on here. You know, they even get out to Silver Spring and Falls Church. You'll recognize a lot of the names on here. You got Wonderland's Ballroom, Red Derby, Looking Glass, like all of these standby DC favorites. But yeah, but there's been a bit of a Twitter storm saying, you know, there's there's all these ones that are left out. You know, DC does have a great dive bar scene. You know, I think there's about 10 or 15 on the list. Inevitably, some are going to be left out. Well, I guess my first question is, what do you guys think makes a good dive bar? Well, that's the thing. I mean, they, they use a word like, what do they say in there? Here are 18 reliable, somewhat grungy, and definitely solid choices for unpretentious evening out in the DC area. So their standards, not bad, are reliable, grungy, and unpretentious. You know, I feel like we've come to such a crazy moment in sort of nightlife and drinking that like there's like dive bar themed bars that are like, you know, incredibly expensive and the grunge is phony. Uh, But at the same time, look, look, I think what makes the best bar uh, most of the time for me is like a place where I can go sit with my friends and hang out and want to stay. And and one of the things that makes you want to stay is not having your entire bank account drained. I think going beyond that, you you get into sort of matters of aesthetics that are difficult to trick out. I used to, in you know, in my twenties, spend a great deal of time at the Raven in Mount Pleasant, where I lived, which is sort of as close to unchanged as you can find in in DC. We did have a couple of people email us saying that the Raven was a significant oversight. So you're not alone. I would say so. But on the other hand, I don't know that just being unchanged is the thing that makes you come back. I mean. Partly, and maybe I'm going to sound old here. It's like being able to get a seat, which is, you know, a, a, a tricky thing. It has like a neighborhood vibe, a neighborhood feel. Michael, what about you? Well, I'm going to be a hometown boy here and shout out to the Clarendon bar that made the list Galaxy Hut. I love this place. Great food, great vibe. They also have arcade games, so like Galaga. Um, so, Shout out to Galaxy Hut. If your listeners haven't been there, you should go to Clarendon and check it out. In term, you mentioned the aesthetics. This is obviously kind of the important thing, other than the price point, like it has to be cheap, right? The two aesthetics things that I think of in terms of a dive bar, one of which is illegal now in our modern world, which is smoking. So like in my mind's eye, when I think about a dive bar, I think about, you know, the old smoky uh, really horrible, smoky places. You know, you would open the door and you would get like yesterday's smoke would hit you in the face. I know, and it kept the riffraff out. That's gross. <laughs> that, that's a dive bar. I, another dive bar aesthetic that I really like is 
the dollar bills stapled to the wall. There was a dive bar in Old Town that was in a basement and they had all of these dollar bills. There was like hundreds of them and people would do graffiti on them and they would staple them to the walls and they had been there for like decades. And so it was kind of like a museum in a way of dive bar history. So um, those are the things that I would look for in terms of the aesthetics of a dive bar. I mean, the one thing I would push back on, Kayla, is I don't know that DC actually does have a great dive bar scene. I mean, I don't even know that the dive bar scene is not a contradiction in terms. But the thing that makes it possible to have an unpretentious and not that expensive place is rent, is rent not being insane. And uh, one of the things about DC is that most of the, particularly the nightlife areas, but a lot of sort of quieter areas, storefronts are just still pretty expensive to rent, which means that like it's pretty hard to survive if you're selling a few beers an hour to people who are hanging out. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to obviously disagree with you there, Mike. I think maybe it's the sort of the yuppie in me, (laughs) but I do think DC has some great dives. I mean, I think every neighborhood has, you know, at least two or three of these spots that you're describing, right? Sort of neighborhoody, cheaper spots that you can get, you know, beer and shot combo. You can get fries that just taste like oil, you need to come to my neighborhood. Yeah, okay, maybe not love, you. I would love such a place. <laughs> Which bars on the list would you recommend or that you've been to that you liked? Yeah, I guess, you know, some of the ones are on the list that I love. Honestly, they're all great. I don't think Dan's Cafe is a dive. I don't I don't know. I just, something about that doesn't give the aesthetic of a dive bar to me. Obviously, Wonderland's Ballroom, you have to go to. I think a new one that's great is Johnny's All-American Although I will say that definitely sort of toes the line of being what Mike was saying. More on the bougie side, you know, I think drinks are probably upwards of $10. Looking Glass Lounge is another classic one in Park View. Um, but I think there's like definitely some ones that are that are missing on the list. One of my favorites in my neighborhood here is Grand Duchess. It's just super a super sweet one in Adams Morgan. Jackpot in Chinatown is missing. You get free popcorn. Who doesn't love that? I love free popcorn. That actually does have a dive bar vibe to it as well. Yeah, right? Underground. And it smells good. Is there any place with free hot dogs? Um, that, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> and if they did, I'm not sure you'd want them. That was a thing in Philly when I lived there. Oh, wow. I don't know if I want free meats of any kind. <laughs> you never were sure you wanted them. And also, you know, some of our readers pointed out that the blaggard isn't on the list, which also feels like, you know, a big oversight to me. The blaggard is in Adams Morgan. All right. Well, so maybe um, before the next time we do this, you need to take me and Michael out to your favorite dives. Yeah, we can have a dive bar crawl. Sounds really fun. And Michael can fill us in on whether this stadium thing actually can go through. All right, well, listen, you guys, thank you for being here. Thank you. That is all for today here on CityCast DC. Our senior executive producer is Priyanka Tilbe. Our senior producer is Julia Karen. Our newsletter editor is Kayla Cote-Stemmerman. Our production assistant is Ash Durbin. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, raise a glass to it at your cheapest neighborhood bar. We're off Monday for President's Day, and we will be back Tuesday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.